Hey, hey everybody, happy Tuesday. Welcome to my kitchen. Just gonna take a few minutes for everyone to catch up with me and jump on in and say good morning. Good morning, Ingrid, hi everyone. We're building up quite a nice little family. Someone said to me in an email the other day that it's like a family. We are building, it. it is. It's like the 11.30 family. Um, today, I even forgot to watch the press conference. Um, I'd been setting an alarm on my phone for 10.58 to remind me to watch the press conference and I forgot this morning. I sometimes somehow turned my alarm off and missed it. It wasn't good news, so probably better to miss it today, I think. Let's forget about the outside world, okay, for the moment. I just want to focus on recipes and stories today because I've got a story to go with this meatloaf that I just love to tell. Good morning, Linda from the States. Good morning, Marla from Washington State. Good morning, good morning, Brizzy Chris. Hi, everybody. So good to have Thalia with us. Is it pronounced Thalia or Talia? I'm not sure, sorry. Hey, good morning, good morning. So nice, everyone's waiting. Hey. Hey, Viv. Hey, Esther, good to have you here. Um, Esther, you know this meatloaf well, like I do. So when everybody's joined, morning, Lance. Hi, hi, everybody. So good to have so many of you with me today. It's really the highlight of my day and I've missed you all. Of course I did the donut workshop on Sunday which was, I thought it was so much fun and I was so amazed by all the donuts that everybody made. Did you see them on Insta Stories? I was just absolutely amazed. Um, if you want to catch up, we now have that video and the recipes as a product in our online store. If you want to buy it, you can grab that and um, see what we did for that live cook along. It was amazing fun. Hey Calm in Canada, how are you going? Hi Gigi, hello everybody. Lockdown in Armadale, hey. Shout out to everybody who's in lockdown. New lockdown people in Byron Bay, um, it just sucks big time. But we're not gonna talk about it, okay? Um, hey Ash, good to see you here. Hey everybody. I might just stay here and say hello. I always say that, don't I? But it's so tempting just to like, you know, lean on the bench and just, just chat to all of you and not cook at all. Morning, Marcel, good to have you here. Hey, Julia. So many familiar names. I just love it. I really, really love it. Okay, let's talk meatloaf. So when we were writing the first book, which is this one here, and we started writing it, we got together in 2006 to start collecting recipes from the Jewish community in Sydney. That was where we started. And I remembered that when I was um, 16, my parents brought me to Sydney from Melbourne for a holiday. It was my first visit to Sydney. I remember still seeing the King's Cross Coke sign. I remember driving across the Harbour Bridge. I remember three things, the Coke sign, driving across the Harbour Bridge and going to Auntie Ray's Deli in Queen Street, Wallara and eating the best meatloaf sandwich I have ever had. Okay, I was 16, okay? Fast forward to 2006, let's say, when we were well into collecting, okay? That's a lot of years later, okay? So I was 16, that was, uh, yeah, 1980, I'm gonna say it. And, okay, so we are talking 30, no, 26 years after that, okay? I remembered the meatloaf. I still remembered it, and I thought, I've gotta find it. Sadly, Ray had passed away, and I'll tell that story in a moment, but my mum is still best friends with Sarah in Sydney, in Melbourne, Sarah Romanstone. And Sarah happens to be Ray's sister. So I asked Sarah for the recipe. She had it vaguely scribbled down without proper measurements or method or anything. And we used that as a basis to create this meatloaf. And I'm sure it's not exactly the same as Ray's because that's what happens when recipes aren't um, recorded, you know, precisely and checked and tested. Um, but it's my version of Ray's meatloaf. So let me tell you about Ray. So um, I'll go back last to two generations to the Fane family who've moved from Poland to Melbourne in the 20s. And they had four kids, three girls, Sarah, Shirley and Ray and one son, Mori. They lived in Melbourne and... and when Ray was 16, so that would have been probably in the mid 40s, I'm guessing, they moved to Sydney. So Ray moved to Sydney. Ray left her family in Melbourne, moved to Sydney, met her husband, Ron, got married, had kids, was an amazing, amazing cook. 
So with that incredible skill, what did Ray do but open Auntie Ray's Deli in Queen Street, Woolara, where she cooked. And I'm going to read to you what we wrote about her, okay? Can I just read a little bit from this book? Because in our books we've got stories as well as recipes, and I just love this one. So um, Ray was 16 when their father moved the family. Oh, sorry, I got that wrong, completely wrong. Ray and the family moved to Sydney and her parents, Sarah, stayed in Melbourne. Sorry, got that wrong. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Ray was 16 when their father moved the family, except for newly married Sarah, to Sydney. That's my timer. And she'd already begun to develop a strong interest in food and cooking. She happily settled into life in a new city, married Ron, and started a family of her own. When Ray and Ron opened Auntie Ray's Deli in Wallara in the 80s, she lovingly cooked all the house dishes herself. Her specialties included chopped liver, all my favourites, egg and onion, a huge variety of frittatas and, of course, her meatloaf. With her chatty personality and sense of humour, she adored the local customers and thrived on the camaraderie that existed in the area. Ray passed away in 1997. She is remembered not only for her exceptional cooking, but also for being an integral Wallara village personality. So, um, it's very special to be talking about Ray, particularly because I see I have Sue Ellen, Ray's daughter, on with us today, our stroke was, hey, hey Sue Ellen, how are you? Good to see you here, really, talking about your mum and honouring her memory. I remember her, I think she may have had a cigarette smoking outside the deli. Would that be right, when I was 16? Or maybe it was a bit later. Um, it's just extraordinary that I have such a strong memory of that meatloaf, because it was unique and delicious and amazing. And we'll talk about the meatloaf now. So that's that's where this recipe comes from. So it's way more than just a meatloaf. It is a meatloaf with a heritage and a history, which I absolutely love. So I've got one that's in the oven. I'm gonna go backwards today because I wanna show you what it looks like when you've got to baste it. Okay, so I put one in already. But this is really, oh, it smells so good. Okay, so this is really the secret to the meatloaf is the glaze and the basting. So. It's been in for 40 minutes. You can see that the glaze has dried up a bit. So I'm just going to pop in a little bit of hot water, just a bit, maybe another quarter cup. And shut my oven. And I'm just going to give it a baste. It's really important to do that. I'm just going to turn the light on for a sec so you can see. Okay. Um, that's good. So just mix it around, get all those bits up and just baste it again for the last, it's going to cook for about 50 minutes, so or six, if you've got a big loaf it's going to need longer. Already looks amazing, I have to say. Okay, so I've given it a good base to put a bit of water in it, and that's what yours is going to look like after 40 minutes. Okay, really good. So back in the oven. going to put a timer on. It's probably going to need another 15. That'll be perfect timing. Okay, so now we're ready to make the meatloaf. Oh, it's very funny because I've been chatting to Calm um, in Canada on direct message on Instagram and she was trying to guess how old I am and um, they couldn't work it out, her and her daughter, I think it was. And I said, you just got to keep guessing. I'll keep giving you clues. But today I pretty much told you, didn't I? If I was 16 in 1980, you can work it out. Yep. I am no spring chicken. Anyway, um, all right, how's everyone going? Everyone going, ready to cook along with me? Who's cooking along? I would love to know. Is anyone, um, sometimes we get stuck here and sometimes no one says anything. So you know what, sometimes I don't know if we're stuck or no one says anything. So no one's talking to me, that's all right. I'll just keep talking to you and to myself. Don't worry, it's all good. Okay, let's go through the ingredients we need. I think it's a good idea when you're making this meatloaf to make a kilo of mince. Depends how many you're feeding, but this is what I would do. I make a kilo of mince, make the whole thing, divide it in half, make a log and pop it in the freezer wrapped well. Then next week when you want meatloaf, you just take and take it out and it's ready. It, you know, it just is, is like, you know, um, two for the price of one sort of thing. So um, I'm glad there's lots of you cooking. Dorit, Melanie, Tessa, excellent, excellent. Or maybe that's Tess. Linda, fantastic. So we've got our mince. We're going to go one kilo of mince. And please use premium mince. Lean mince, you know what? It's just not going to be as good. You need the fat. A lot of it's going to come out, but it's going to come out and then you're going to baste the meatloaf in the fat. And it just needs 
a good quality mince with a little bit of fat in it, okay? Fat is good, I really believe it is. Okay, a kilo of mince. We've got one brown onion. It's hiding over here. Okay, so an onion, I've peeled it. A carrot, I just washed it, I didn't peel it. Don't worry about peeling it. And I've got a handful of parsley chopped. I don't wanna confuse you, but I'm only making half here. But don't let that confuse you. You're making of one kilo, and I'm gonna talk the measurements as if I'm doing one kilo, okay? So we've got one kilo of mince, one onion peeled, brown or white or red, it doesn't really matter, a whole carrot, and a handful of parsley. You'll also need one egg, which you're gonna just beat like that in a glass or a cup or whatever, um, one cup of fresh breadcrumbs. Now, um, a friend of mine made a beautiful sourdough loaf for me on the weekend and I ate a lot of it on Saturday night, probably like half a loaf between two of us. And then I made the rest into breadcrumbs and I used them last night for a crumb chicken that you bake and not fry. They were amazing, amazing. And I'm using them in my meatloaf. And all you do is take a loaf of bread or whatever bread you're using, half a loaf, take the crusts off and put it in the food processor until you have fresh breadcrumbs. You can freeze them till you need them. They're really, it's really worthwhile. The bread can be three, four days old and it's just absolutely perfect for this sort of thing. If you don't have any fresh breadcrumbs and you've only got panko, for example, I would probably moisten the panko with some water before putting it in and let it sit and soak it up and become a little bit more, um, a little softer and more like fresh bread. And if you only have dry breadcrumbs, that's also fine. Just use those, okay? Um, okay, so good question. If you're halving the recipe with the egg, just beat the egg in a glass and use half of it and keep half in your fridge with covered with plastic wrap for when you need to glaze your hullah or pastry or something. You'll use it, I promise you, in the next week. I can't promise that. I withdraw that promise. I don't mean promise. I always use it whenever I chuck out a half an egg the next day, I'm thinking, oh, I needed that egg. So don't get rid of it, okay? Uh, morning, Pam, good to see you here. Hope you are well. All right, what's well, one cup of fresh breadcrumbs. We have got Worcestershire sauce, um, two to three tablespoons. I guess if you love the flavor, you're gonna put three. If you don't love it, you just want two, okay? So somewhere in between, if you're not sure. <laughs> And of course, two tablespoons of tomato sauce, which is ketchup, you know, Heinz, the old Heinz or whatever brand you use. I know that there's a bit of a Heinz versus a Rosella debate in Australia. I grew up with Rosella. I moved to Sydney. My husband, Danny, loves Heinz. It's taken 30 years. I'm now a Heinz person. You know, you got to do what you got to do. So, um... That's it, and of course salt and pepper, and we're gonna taste it. Now, I left out the garlic, because I'm not putting garlic in mine, but if you want two cloves of garlic, crush them in a garlic press, and that'll be added to it as well, okay? <coughs> yes, you can use meat, you, other meat, um, Robin. You can use um, chicken mince, works really well as well. What else would you use? I don't know, I've never made a meatloaf with lamb. Um, I think that would be just a bit weird, but I would do, um, you could use veal mince, you could use beef, obviously beef mince and chicken. Um, okay, so Debbie, good question. We're gonna make the mince for one kilo as a mixture with everything in it and season it and taste it. Then we're gonna weigh it and divide it in half. We're gonna make two equally equal beautiful logs. You're gonna wrap one up and put it in the freezer, ready to pull out, make the glaze and cook. And one we're gonna to cook today. Okay, yeah, turkey mince would be great. I think that's a great idea. I know a lot of people love turkey. It is very lean though, so it's perhaps not gonna be as luscious as if you use chicken mince with some chicken thighs in there. You gotta just think about this thing. It's roasting on its own. There's no fat in the sauce. It's, it's going to potentially dry out. So the leaner meat you use, the drier it's gonna be. And we're looking for a really juicy, succulent piece of meatloaf that you're just gonna go nuts for, okay? But, you know, if you're happy with turkey mince, go ahead. You could probably put a splash of olive oil in to compensate. That might be an idea. All right. This is one of those recipes, I think like every recipe I do these days, where it's really a five-minute thing, but I turn a five-minute recipe into a 40-minute conversation because that's, that's what we do. That's what we're here for, right? We're here to chat. We're here to have some distraction. We're here to have some fun. It's very bright. Okay, turning that light off. Okay, excellent. So, 
let's start. Now, um, my friend Lance messaged me this morning and said, what do we do with the carrot and the onion? And that's a good question because I never said. And I never said on purpose because I wanted to talk about what we're going to do with it. And we're going to grate it. And I think that grating onion for this meatloaf just helps spread the onion throughout. And it sometimes, it depends if you want little bits of onion in your meatloaf. And it really doesn't, um, doesn't matter if you want it chopped rather than grated, that's also fine. I just like grating it. And then you get some of the onion juice as well, which goes through the meat. Um, Debbie, you know what, if you asked a question and you missed the answer, I just can't repeat it. Of course, I'm joking. Um, okay, yes, <laughs> the doorbell rang. I know, bloody doorbell, isn't it annoying when it rings in the middle of a conversation? Okay, to answer your question again, we're going to make the meat, the mince with all the seasonings together. We're going to divide it. We're going to make two logs. We're going to freeze one and bake one with the glaze. So we're only making one quantity of glaze for half the meat mixture, okay? So frozen, unglazed, uncooked, frozen raw. Okay, so let's grate our onion. I'm gonna use a box grater with the coarse side. Unlike when I was grating eggs the other day, this is harder because it's slippery. It's very, very easy to slip and grate your knuckles. And honestly, grated knuckles are just the worst thing in the world. Really, as far as kitchen injuries go, so much pain and you've got to throw out whatever you're making like it's just double pain you know okay so hold it tightly and we're just gonna grate and this is gonna make you cry I already cried this morning when I did that batch okay good Debbie got it I'm happy but feel free to ask a third time I really don't mind at all okay um, okay it's very very and someone told me that if you have a wet paper towel near you when you're grating onions that it's it, it does something but you know what we'll see Let's see, so just grate. And onions are slippery, so just take care when you're doing it. Of course you can do it in the machine. If you want to dirty your machine, it'll take one second to grate it. I'm just gonna do, and because mine was a big onion, I'm not that stressed that I'm not doing the whole thing. Okay, I'm leaving the outer layer out and just carefully trying to grate it. Remember your palm is a really good way to grate things because you can't, you can't, um, get your knuckles in the way, but it's harder with an onion than an egg because it's really slippery. So just uh, tempting. Yeah, Nikki says, where are my goggles? You know what? You're so right. I was going to put my onion goggles on, but I didn't want to be like, you know, you'd all like laugh at me and go, oh, she needs onion goggles for half an onion. What sort of a bloody cook is she? So I know I should have because my eyes are starting to cry now, even with my glasses, even with the paper towel. Grating onion makes it very, very crying very crying all right my onion is grated okay and now I'm going to grate my carrot I didn't peel it because I'm lazy don't have to it doesn't matter won't make any difference and now I'm crying but hopefully you're all crying with me so it's like you know we're all in this together right and again great with care I don't want any grated thumbs or knuckles it really hurts just love turning a five minute recipe into an hour recipe it's just really quite a an achievement you know people want to shorten everything we want to make things longer I think that's fantastic um, yes of course grate it all together in the machine chuck it in don't put the meat in though just the uh, onion and the carrot okay all right how's it going oh is anyone crying with me who's crying from the onion like I've literally got tears now full on tears from a half an onion I'm taking great care at the end of the carrot because I don't want to grate okay that'll do and it's always easier to grate onto a flat plate or a board rather than into a bowl oh yeah hey, Michelle you're crying with me ah, yeah yeah I'm definitely crying definitely crying from those onions it's amazing how it makes you cry I just think it's very funny <laughs> it's crying with me oh uh, yeah we're all we're all crying together Bev it's good it's a good group cry and a group hug at the same time that's what we're doing all right so I've got my grated carrot and onion 
I've got my mincemeat into in a big bowl. Remember, it's always easier to put things into a way bigger bowl than you think you need. It's just much easier to mix things when you've got space around it. You know, often you think, oh, I've only got a little bit of mince. I'm going to do it in a tiny bowl. And then you can't get in there because we're going to mix this with our hand, okay? All right, so into the mince we are putting... Um, yeah, Calm says hopefully everyone's got waterproof mascara. Well, I would guess, I would bet, I would bet $1,000... No, I'm not going to get it really, but I would think, think that I'm the only one in lockdown with mascara on. Tell me who else has got mascara on in lockdown. Anyone? Ah, good question, Arlene. I didn't actually say what temperature the oven is on. It's 180. Thank you for that. So I was too busy telling stories and, and talking to sell. Tell you that the oven needs to be on 180 degrees Celsius. That's a conventional temperature, okay? Fan frost oven, you probably want 165. Okay, yeah, see, Doric doesn't have mascara on. Bet you no one in lockdown. Why would you have mascara in lockdown? Like, honestly, mm -mm. Michelle, is that a tick? You do have mascara? I have mascara for you. That's well, really for me, so that when I watch the video back, I don't go like, oh my God, those eyes, where are they? So, okay. Um, so, calm wall makeup every day during three lockdowns. Wow, that's commitment. Can't say I've done that. Um, okay, listen to this. Great onion with water in your mouth. Ah, well, you just keep watering your mouth while you're grating it. Interesting. And the onion should come from the fridge. Yes, you can cook it later. The recipe actually says to put it in the fridge for a couple of hours, the mixture, before you form the log. But I find it easier to form the log. But by all means, form the log and stick it in the fridge. Absolutely. All right. So, um, yeah, it's very funny. Yeah, Celia says, mascara replaces lipstick because we can see eyes but not lips in the mask. It's so true. So funny. You don't even need any makeup with a, with a mask except for your, for your eyes. And we're going to cook it for 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how fat the log is, okay? The thinner the log, the less time it'll take. Now, mine, I think, is ready. My time is about to go off. I can stay a bit more. Okay, let's make this. So first, I'm going to put in the meat, the onion, the carrot, the breadcrumbs. And if you've soaked panko, um, squeeze the liquid out and put the breadcrumbs in and leave the liquid out, okay? Um, so making breadcrumbs from bread, you take your loaf of bread, cut off the crusts. I don't love the crusts in the breadcrumb. Um, you can toast them and make toasts with them. Don't throw them out. And then just slice the bread up into, or cut it into chunks, put it in a food processor and process it until you have breadcrumbs. It's super easy. Never, ever, ever throw out bread that you don't want to eat. Like just don't ever throw it out. There's so many uses. Make toast, make breadcrumbs, you know, worth doing and then they're in the freezer for any time you need them all right then we're going to add the egg it's not a it's not a um complicated recipe as you see you, you can see it's just literally putting everything in okay the tomato sauce and the worcestershire okay and then you can do it, do it with a spoon but i'm going to do it with my hand because we're going to do the whole thing with our hand as well um okay so aura's husband doesn't want carrot in the meatloaf I think it needs the sweetness. I really, really do. So why don't you just put a half a carrot in and grate it on the fine side of the grater so he doesn't know. And we won't tell him, okay? Of course my hand's in it and now my meatloaf's ready. I'm gonna have to take it out. Hold on a sec. Need to just wash that hand. Now, we'll have to also find out which of you are gonna be happy to taste raw meat and raw egg. Some are and some aren't, I know. Oh yeah. Alright, my meatloaf is done, it looks, it smells, I mean the smell of this with the Worcestershire and the, and the sugar and the tomato and that's the meatloaf, it is really, really, really good, okay, the glaze is pretty much dried up, there's a little tiny bit left that I'm going to, oh, that I'm going to actually spoon on top of the meatloaf so i'm going to collect all that glaze that's around it i'll go back to the mixture in a minute okay and the quantities i'm just going to do this now while it's hot so you can see i'm scraping up the glaze because you don't want to lose this glaze it is it's the best now it's got meat juices and a bit of fat and the ingredients from the glaze and it just is delicious so what i would actually do is put as much as you can on top like that Okay, see how glazed it is? 
and when it cools a bit, take the meatloaf out. Um, yes, I have forgotten to add the parsley, but I'll go back in a sec. Um, let it cool and get a spatula and scrape out every last bit of that glaze, okay? I don't want any left in the pan. You've got to eat it. And you can actually just put it on the sandwiches as well as like a condiment. So good. Okay, so that's the finished meatloaf. We'll come back to that. All right, let me concentrate now. Yes, I did forget the parsley. So let me go through the ingredients again. We've got one kilo of mince. We've got a brown onion, which I've grated. A carrot, which I haven't peeled because I was lazy and I've grated. One egg, one cup of fresh bread breadcrumbs, or you could use a cup of panko that you've soaked in water and then squeezed and put in. You have got two cloves of garlic crushed. If you like garlic, I leave it out. Uh, two tablespoons of tomato sauce, as in ketchup, Heinz or Rosella, whichever brand you like. Two to three tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce, depending on how much you like it. We love it. And a handful of continental or flat leaf parsley chopped, okay, in there. Thank you for reminding me. Now, I know it's going to need seasoning, so before I put my hand in, even though my hand was already in, I'm just going to put in probably, probably need a teaspoon of salt in that one kilo to start with and a really good grind of pepper. And now I'm going to put my hand in and I'm going to mix it all together and get out that big piece of onion and just squeeze it together because you're just using your hand to mix it. If you don't want to put your hand in, use a wooden spoon. Um, just don't do this in the food processor because I don't want to puree the meat, okay? Interestingly, when we're making pierogan, which are little meat pies on Thursday, we do use the food processor. And when I first got that recipe, I just thought, how bad is that going to be? But actually, it's fantastic. But for this, we want the meat to be ground meat, okay? So, more minced meat, if you're in Australia, I should say. All right, so that's mixed really nicely. I'm using my fingertips to make sure everything is mixed. And now I have to taste it, okay? Um, and some people don't like raw meat, and some people don't like raw egg. Yum. So could just have that on a sandwich. Needs a bit more salt. Um, but you need to concentrate. I, I do. I find I need to concentrate when I taste. It's not enough to just do a quick taste. I need to really think about what I'm tasting. Has it got enough salt? Um, has it got enough pepper? Does it need something else? Would I like another splash of Worcestershire? You know, all of those things you need to just consider. Now, the recipe says to put this in the fridge for a couple of hours like this. I guess the idea is that it's easier to make a loaf when the mixture is has come together in the fridge. It's going to be a bit more solid. But I actually don't find that you need to do that at all, and you can skip that altogether. Or if you want to cook it later, of course you can do it. So divide your mix. Uh, now we're going to roll the logs. So I'd like you to divide your mixture in half. You can weigh it. It's obviously going to be two kilos and a bit. Sorry, one kilo and a bit. Um, or you can just eyeball, eyeball it and divide into half, which is what I'm going to do, okay? So we've got, um, so divide your mixture into two, okay? Because I'm only making half, I'm not dividing it, but ignore that. If you're making one kilo, divide your mixture into two, put one of the parts aside, and get yourself a baking dish or a roasting pan. Um, I did go over the breadcrumbs, and the breadcrumb answer was you take your loaf of bread, you cut off the crusts, you cut it into chunks or slices, you put it in a food processor, and you process it until you get fine bread, you know, fresh breadcrumbs. Um, you know, they, first it'll be big chunks, then little chunks, and then breadcrumbs. And then I just put them into takeaway containers or freezer safe containers, label them. 80 grams, one cup fresh bread crumbs, so you know next time, and put them in the freezer. Uh, and then you've got them for a long time. Don't ever throw out fresh bread. Okay, roasting pan. I'm using a small one, because I'm only doing, we're doing 500 gram loaf, because we've divided the one kilo now, with all the stuff in it, into two. And take, give it a, take your big clump of meat, and, and seasonings and spices, and put it in here and with wet hands or not it's really up to you sometimes wet hands makes it easier okay and you were just going to shape it and the, what the water does actually and I will use this water here 
is it just helps make it a bit smoother. Um, so, Ross, yes, you can make one giant roll, absolutely, but then you'll need to double the glazed ingredients that I gave you because I only gave you the ingredient quantities for one log. But we'll go through that in one second. So you can feel that it's a bit floppy and a bit hard to come together and keeping it in the fridge for a couple of hours before shaping it will make it easy, but it's not. I just don't think it's absolutely necessary, okay? So what we're doing is using some water on our hands to make a lovely smooth log. Now... The longer and thinner your log is, the more glazed, crisp, not crispy, glazed, um, what's the word, like the succulent outside you'll get. You know, it, it's just a beautiful outside. So if you like the outside more than the inside, make it longer and thinner. If you like the inside more than the outside, then make it fatter. This is just a nice size, okay? So mine is about the width of a, what can I say, you know, it's probably a tennis ball, this width of this, okay, crust, thank you, that's the word I'm looking for, crust, <laughs> sometimes like, my words just don't come to my head when I'm cooking because I'm concentrating on getting this low fright, so back to um, Aura, whose husband doesn't like carrot, have you put the carrot in, I hope you have, because it really adds some sweetness which it needs, forget smelling, so, um, yeah, I mean, Marcel says it even smells good raw. It tastes good raw. Forget smells. It tastes delicious. Okay. That's it. Log done. Now we need to make the glaze. So the glaze is really the secret to this meatloaf, I have to say. You need yourself a little jug. And this is the glaze for one of, no, one of the loaves. I've just realized, let's glaze this and put it in the oven. And then you'll need to roll the other loaf. So I hope I haven't confused you too much. So this is 500 grams of the mixture which we've rolled into a loaf. With your other part of the mixture, roll it into exactly the same loaf, but do it on your bench top and then wrap it in plastic wrap and then foil and then stick it in the freezer. Labelled, this is 500 grams of meatloaf raw. So you know for next time. And then next week you just pull it out in the morning, let it defrost and go ahead with the glaze and cooking it. So you should have two like this. Now we're gonna do the glaze for one meatloaf only, okay? And in the glaze we have a little bit of brown sugar. The original recipe I think had two tablespoons. I've just cut a half a tablespoon out. It's just, it is very sweet. You can afford to cut out a tiny bit of the sugar. Oh, no, that would've been good. Brown sugar. Um, I, what page number in the book? You know what, that's a really good question. It is page 65, okay, in the book. Okay, so brown sugar, tomato sauce, and Worcestershire. So two tablespoons of tomato sauce, two tablespoons of Worcestershire, one and a half tablespoons of brown sugar, and two tablespoons of water, which I'm gonna pour in there to try and get that tomato sauce out. Okay, so. I have everything out. I need to just wash my hands. My trusty blue chucks. Okay. Okay, great. So the glaze is done, just in a jug. Again, four ingredients. Brown sugar, Worcestershire, tomato sauce and water. Um, uh, okay, so Linda's got a glaze like this from Betty Crocker with a little dry mustard, delicious. I think this combo is fantastic. Worcestershire just makes everything yum. Okay, so that's it. And all we do now is pour it over. Um, okay, so a third of a cup of everything for the glaze was in the original recipe, but I'm going through the recipe that I posted on Instagram. Okay, so I'm not going from the original because I'm only making a 500 gram loaf today, not the one kilo loaf, okay? So we're going from the ingredients that I posted on Instagram, which is two tablespoons, um, which is um, half of half, half of a third of a cup, okay? So I've literally halved the glazed ingredients from the book, okay? I hope that makes sense to you. So 500 grams of mince made into a loaf, half the glazed ingredients from the book, and I'm gonna just pour it over. The recipe is on Instagram and it will be posted with, with the video on IGTV. 
You know what I forgot to do in all this excitement? Oh, no, I did. I did taste it. I did, I did, I did. I didn't forget anything. Thank goodness. So that's it. We're going to roast it uncovered because what we're trying to do is to get caramelization of the meat and the juices and liquid will come out and water and fat will come out of the meatloaf as it cooks, mixed with the glaze. And then every 20 minutes, and I'd actually set my timer, I want you to baste it, okay? And by basting, I mean taking a spoon, like I showed you in the very beginning, tipping the pan and spooning the glaze all over it from the bottom, okay? You do it every 15 minutes. It really, really makes it very, very delicious if you keep on basting with the glaze continuously. Well, you know, every 15, 20 minutes. Um, I did not oil the base. Melanie, good question. No, enough fat comes out, but it doesn't stick. Um, it's it's a delicious dinner. Again, if you're at this stage and you want to cook it tonight, then just cover it with something and put it in the fridge. Bring it out to let it get to room temperature before you roast it. That's always a good idea. Um, and I think it needs between 50 and 60 minutes to um, cook it to, to glazed, crusty perfection. Now I'm going to grab mine. I'm going to put this in the oven and um, my timer on. I just put it on the bottom shelf. It doesn't need any special attention. And I'm just going to put my timer on for 20 minutes so I will remember. Now I want to show you, I'm just going to clean up my mess for one second. I'm going to get a plate and a knife. Because I want to show you lovely sticky juices from the glaze that you just mustn't throw out okay it's just unbelievably delicious so if I was making a sandwich with this I would probably let it cool a little bit and I would just pop it um, on some beautiful fresh sourdough bread or rye bread slice of meatloaf a smear of mustard um, some coleslaw or some chopped lettuce and rocket you could put um, a couple of slices of tomato. What else would you like to put in it? I mean, it's endless, you know. Um, it's, it's just such a good base for a sandwich or a meal. If I was serving as a, for a meal, uh, my on. if I was serving it for a meal, I would love to make it with mashed potato and a green salad and some green vegetables. Um, Okay, so you can see it doesn't stick at all. Um, it's a beautiful little meatloaf. It does streak, and I think this is nice for probably two to three people. Depends how big an eater you are. For lunch, of course, it's a lot more. You get a lot out of it. And then you've got this glaze, which is now like a jam. Um, look at that. It's like a sticky jam. It is so, so good. Don't get rid of that, okay? And then to cut it, Yum. It's just so moist on the inside and that crust is absolutely perfect. Please don't leave the carrot out, Aura. Please don't. It really adds a sweetness that you need inside. And that's it. It's just a beautiful, beautiful meatloaf. And I'm going to taste it because I know I have to. You know, the things I do for you guys, I just want you to appreciate it. But I've got to eat this meatloaf just for you. Yum. I find this irresistible and... Oh my god. I haven't had it for a few years. It's just so, so, so good. And that's just on its own with nothing. But imagine sitting on a bed of mashed potato, a spoon of that jammy glaze, green, fresh green salad on the side, um, maybe some blanched snow peas or peas would be absolutely beautiful. And again, in a sandwich, toasted or otherwise, um, yet yeah, come add cheese to the sandwich if you're happy to have cheese and meat which I am yum you could you can make an absolutely delicious I've also got some cucumber salad in the fridge you know that Hungarian style with vinegar and a bit of sugar I would drain that and put the cucumbers in the sandwich as well you know something fresh and light and something crunchy and something um, juicy and wet also to go in there like just have everything in that one sandwich yum okay how long in the oven yeah 180 degrees 
Uh, total probably 50 minutes, okay, give or take how wide or narrow your loaf is. Remember to keep basting that glaze and when it gets dry after about 40 minutes, add a quarter of a cup of boiling water to the glaze in the pan, mix it all up, get all that glaze, those glazy bits and baste it again, okay? Keep basting and keep basting. Um, that is it for me today. I'm so proud that I've done a 45 minute meatloaf that should have just taken five minutes. Um, yep, 180 Celsius, that's it, not fan forced, in a conventional oven. Um, brown sugar, any brown sugar is fine. I'm using soft brown sugar. Um, okay, so if you do the one kilo, are you better to do one big log or two small? That's a really good question. I love the edges. I love the crusty outside, so I would do two because you get more crust per, you know, amount of meat. I think it's, a, it's more crusty and more delicious. Um, yeah, oh yeah, Celia, you gave up meat. Why? Why? It's so good from time to time. I'm not saying we should eat meat all the time, but to have this, it's just absolutely delicious. And the smell of this when you cook it, you know, that Worcestershire makes your mouth water. It's just a yummy thing and I love it. Um, okay, so in fan frost, I would probably do 165, something like that, if you've got a really good fan frost oven. I can see out the corner of my eye, Danny's about to open the prunes that I'm about to cook with. Just have a couple. I need them for a recipe. I'm working on something new for Jewish New Year. Um, I'm tired of brisket recipes that, I don't know about you, but I cook brisket a lot and there's always a bit that's dry because there's always that lean bit and that fatty bit and I think I'm going to give up on brisket this year. I'm going to do something fantastic with beef but not brisket. So just wait. I'm going to share that with you in the next couple of weeks. Thank you all. Oh, I talked a lot today. Um, hope you followed along. Hope it wasn't too all over the place. It was, you know, stories and recipes and the finished one finished first before we started it. I know it was all over the place, but you know what? Hope you had fun. I did. Hope your meat life is fantastic. Please post photos. And tomorrow I am back at 11.30 making, oh my God, you've got to come back, potato scallops potato cakes if you're in Melbourne. Yeah, the ones we buy from the fish and chip shop. I'm going to fry them here with you. It's a special treat. It's not everyday food, but you know what? We're in lockdown, so what the hell? That's what I say. They are so good. If you want to cook along with me, the potatoes take... I'm going to post actually how to cook the potatoes ahead of time if you want to, so you can follow along exactly. Otherwise, watch the first part with me and then continue later. The potatoes need about an hour to cook and cool and then another 15 minutes to cool on the bench so um, and we can't go to the next step till that's done um, and so that's it tomorrow potato cakes or scallops Thursday we're making pierogan which are little amazing meat pies also from our first book a South African specialty on Friday I'm making wagon wheels those of you who grew up in Australia know they are the biscuit with jam and marshmallow sandwiched together dipped in chocolate this is a really great one from my friend Jane Lawson who has a beautiful book called Milk Bar Memories. And then on Sunday, of course, I am going to be with Michael Rantese making lunch together. And I just got off the phone with him before this session and um, it, he went through his recipes. Oh my God, his ricotta and roasted tomato tart sounds out of this world. He's going to teach you love and a pastry. He's going to teach you all sorts of amazing things. And I'm going to share with you a rhubarb cobbler for two people, which is out of this world. So sign up to that on Kepos Street Kitchen on their website. Um, there's only limited places for the packs you can get sent to you in Sydney with all the ingredients. Otherwise, you can sign up for the show, for the show, for the class and the recipes only. Um, hope to see you then. That's this week. See you tomorrow. Bye all. Have a great one. Stay safe. Stay home if you're in lockdown and get vaccinated. That's it from me. See you all. Happy cooking.